very nice to be here. I feel quite overawed by the numbers and it always feels a bit audacious to stand up and pretend you know anything about anything. So when somebody introduces you as having spent 25 years on this, you sort of feel you should be kind of on the top of Mount Everest, you know, laying down the law. Uh, all I can tell you is I think I'm at the bottom of Mount Everest because every single day I think I have a new idea about partnership or I reflect or I change. And some of the things I'm going to show you are things that I thought were the truth about 10 years ago and now I think I'm really reconsidering. So I think I totally echo the idea, it doesn't stand still. Um, and really all I'm going to try and do is to share some of my latest thinking. Um, it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster because I have to do three things. I have to spend a bit of time about partnership, defining partnership, what current thinking is about partnership. I have to spend quite a bit of time defining partnership brokering because I suspect for most of you that's a kind of new term. Um, there are six graduates of the program in the room, which is great. So at least six of you know what it is. <laughs> but I would like to spend a bit of time just explaining what that is so it isn't just a mysterious word. Then my suggestion is we have a bit of a pause there and we have a conversation. I would like you to talk to each other as well as ask me questions. I'm happy to answer questions if I can, but I also think it's great if you can take the ideas and discuss them yourselves. So we'll have a pause there and then we'll come back and then I'll spend the last part talking about our approach to monitoring and evaluating, particularly the partnership, which is where you left it, and, and the partnering process. And I think partnership brokers who work very much on the partnering process are in an ideal position to help really uh, review and reflect on and look at the value added of being in a partnership or not, in brackets. And I do, um, I would also say that I'm somewhat sceptical. I'm a complete advocate and totally passionate, otherwise I wouldn't have done it for 25 years. But I'm also sceptical, and I think scepticism is really healthy. So I, I'm not here to try and promote <laughs> partnership is the answer to everything. I think it's very often not the answer to what people are trying to achieve. And I think one of the things I would advocate the partnership brokers do, and anybody else should do, is to decide when things are not appropriately done as a partnership. And I will start by defining partnership in a moment. Um, okay, okay. What I need to show you first is this mysterious picture. It happens to be by our artist in residence at the Partnership Brokers Association. I'm extremely proud of having an artist in residence. She's been accompanying us on this journey for a while and we use a lot of her images in our training courses. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we have one is because I think one of the most important elements of partnering is the exercise of imagination. And how often do people really talk about imagination in partnerships? We've got very much coerced, I think, into a rather practical, technical, uh, funding orientated cycle of working but in my mind my imagination partnership is an opportunity to do things completely differently and absolutely unexpectedly and out of the box and if we don't allow our imaginations to run right if we don't stimulate our imaginations then I think we lose a lot of potential so I'm almost most disappointed by partnerships being a bit predictable and I'm most excited by partnerships that are unpredictable which is the sailboat rather than the trains just to quote so I put this picture up here because I want to try and attribute very carefully what I say because some things I say will be my personal opinion and my own deductions and my own assumptions and I wouldn't want to la laden my organisation or uh, any other organisation I reference with my own deductions because they may be different. Um, so every time you see this picture in a small box in the corner, that's the logo meaning it's my opinion or my personal point of view. Uh, this is the pedigree. I'm not sure if it's crufts. I'm not sure if I I haven't been called a grandmother and a dog in one, in one introduction. It's quite interesting. But anyway, um, just trying to show the pedigree in the sense of, because I think it's, uh, first of all, my original, original pedigree was in theatre. I trained in drama and theatre. I have no development background, no international background, no working with business background. I'm now <coughs> well over 60, so this goes back a long way. But in my earliest incarnation, I trained in theatre. And I came into this work really by, by accident. Maybe all of us did. Um, it was an organisation called the International Business Leaders Forum, so again an interesting connection with Bruce because the, the driver that that organisation had was to make business partners in development and not the enemy. So they were one of the key drivers in the early 90s, 1989 it started, 89 the early 90s, of really driving the idea of business as partners in development, which has now uh, achieved a great deal more currency, but I think, I think that was the first organisation to really pioneer it, particularly in the social realm. I think it was more or less <coughs> parallel with WBCSD, who were more in the environmental realm. So I came into this work, and I, I'm telling you this history for a reason, because when I came into it, I came into it as a total skeptic. I was incredibly anti-business. The CEO, who I happen to know for other reasons, took me on a trip, one of the early trips, and I spent the entire trip criti criticizing the whole thing. And then I said at the end, you know, it's ridiculous to expect business to be partners because they have no idea how to partner with CSOs, never mind NGOs, CSOs, governments, etc. That's just not what they do. 
So you cannot possibly bring two completely different parties into the room and expect them to get on with each other. And he said, hmm, you're quite right. You better come and help us do it. To which I gave him a great list of all the reasons why I wasn't the right person. But he persisted. And I guess I'm telling you the story because my story starts with genuine inquiry. I did not think it was possible. I didn't know how to do it. And all I did was walk around in the various different guises I had to then work and see what was happening and try and make sense out of experience. So I was amused that Booster citing one of my books. So I nudged Herman and said, I have no idea what book he's citing. So he looked it up, and it turned out to be whatever it was. And then I made a list. And in fact, I realized I published 15 books, which actually was a bit scary, because I didn't quite realize that. It kind of grew up rather slowly. The first one was a partnering tool book in India in 1992. Uh, the, the salient one that really changed me from being global ignoramus to global guru, and I'm not joking, was a book called Managing Partnerships in 1998. And it was, I think, the first book that was printed about the partnering process as opposed to the kind of theory of partnering. So that was all under IBLF's umbrella. With IBLF, we set up a relationship with the University <laughs> of Cambridge, which, I mean, I <laughs> don't want to spend too long on this, but that was completely tactical from my point of view because I thought, how do we get partnerships to have more credibility? Hey, hike up with the university. What better university? University of Cambridge. So we had a conversation with the University of Cambridge. They ran for seven years a postgraduate course in cross-sector partnering. There's now a, a, an excellent course in Singapore, but there are not many courses in cross-sector partnering. That led to something called the pa Partnering Initiative, which I think some of you will know about. So I was the founder of that, again, under IBLF's umbrella. And then out of that came the Partnership Brokers Association, and most of my reference points will come from that work. That work started in 2003, but its origins were in a publication in 1998, because my deduction in 1998 was that there was seemed to be the partnerships that were really interesting, and not necessarily the partnerships that were well advertised, but the partnerships that were really interesting almost always had a secret invisible person doing an awful lot of work <coughs> that nobody ever acknowledged, and that somehow the partnership was described as having happened by magic, and everybody was terribly impressed, and nobody really understood how it got there. And it was that very early question about what, what is, what's the glue that makes this work? Who is the person that navigates the kind of conflicts and tensions and things? So we coined the term partnership broker in 2003 and started training people to be partnership brokers on the basis that we're not trying to promote partnership brokers, but we're trying to make more visible a truth, which is that some people somewhere work extremely hard to make partnerships work, and they're very rarely the CEOs. They're very rarely the public figures. They're people who have a deep passion for it, a deep understanding for it, and they, they try and um, grow it. So the Partnership Brokers Association... Uh, the first work started in 2003, the first publications about brokering, and it became an independent entity in 2012. So as an entity, it's quite new. <coughs> and then I've, uh, there are many other partnerships I could quote, but because I'm in Holland, <laughs> and because some of my pet partners are in the room, I'm also quoting a new initiative we've been very happy to be involved with, with Collective Leadership Institute from Germany, Partnerships in Practice, which is a water and sanitation partnership, the Partnering Initiative, which is um, a carry-on from IBLF, our own association and the Partnership Resource Centre, of which Rob and Marika and Stella and various other people are here. So that's five agencies working on PEP. I love the Dutch acronym. I don't know why the Dutch like acronyms so much. But anyway, PEP means Promoting Effective Partnering. And it's particularly dedicated towards the SDGs, and it's a very new initiative, and we're just at the end of a first phase and just about to go into a second phase. But this is on Dutch territory, and it's funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so far. So this is a very recent partnership. Some of the things I'm going to quote are from work that have come out of the work we've done under this partnership. That's an incredibly long introduction, but I hope it gives you a little bit of um, a foundation <laughs> for the remarks I'm going to make. Okay, so I've covered that. I did think I should start. I wasn't going to do this, so it's not on the slides. Um, but I think I should start by a definition of partnership. And for me, defining part, I do get <coughs> the spaghetti soup business of 50, 50 different things are partnerships. But I always try and go back to very basic principles. And if you look at the English dictionary, and of course, one of the problems we have is that partnership is interpreted very differently in different languages. I think in Russian, there are 20 words for partnership. Um, I once gave a, a talk to a group in Slovakia and had a translator. And only halfway through did I realize she was, she was translating partnership as dating agency. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a few problems with this word. But anyway. If you look it up in the dictionary, what it actually means is an ongoing working relationship in which risks and benefits are shared. And actually, I think that's pretty useful because it goes over time, so it's not a quick fix, not a one-off transaction. Risks and benefits are shared, which kind of implies a kind of equilibrium or a kind of balance between the different parties. So I find that quite a good starting point. 
particularly if you translate the word benefit to mean value, or you know, if you think of benefits in the, in the biggest terms. The second thing I would say is that not just everybody risks and benefits, but also that everybody in some measure contributes. And it was interesting, that's where you ended, was the idea that somehow we have an imbalance because some parties contribute an enormous amount of money and then whatever anybody else contributes is rather low key and is not really very uh, taken very seriously. I think that is such a serious thing. And in building equity in partnerships and dealing with power imbalance, which is one of the big problems, it will only ever work if you have a completely redefined view of what resources are. And money only takes its place alongside other resources. And I see several of you nodding, which is encouraging. And we have to get out of the mindset that the only thing that is worth valuing is cash. And I honestly, seriously tell you, <laughs> some of the best partnerships I've ever seen have had almost no cash. And some of the best partnerships have got better when they went through a cash crisis. Um, and if you need an example, the Start Network, which somebody will know about in the UK, which we've worked with quite a lot, um, got a lot of money from DFID, did incredibly well, got fantastic reports, and suddenly for political reasons the money was cut, nothing to do with their evaluation. And then the partners, the members, all agreed to stay together for two years with no funding because they'd found something else about the relationship valuable enough to stick with it. So I think we make a pretty big mistake. So the second thing is everybody has to contribute. That will only work if you value non-cash <coughs> contributions properly. And one of the things m and &E has to do is to work out how to value non-cash contributions. So it isn't just a gift in kind and it isn't just local knowledge in a slightly patronizing way. It's actually something you couldn't do without. If we didn't have local knowledge, we couldn't do this partnership. Therefore, it's just as important as the $100,000. And you can't necessarily value it by monetizing it, but you do have to find a way of giving it value. So I think that's one thing. And then the third thing I would say is that there has to be a strong element of co-creation. And again, you mentioned that at the end. I think we have a lot of partnerships that I would call paper partnerships, where people have cobbled together a partnership because they want to access funding. I mean, I understand it's for very good reason. It's not that they're being corrupt or anything. But if that's the position where people have come together sort of on paper, but have spent no time <laughs> working out how to work together, even if they get the money, the chance of that money being spent in the kind of rich way that one would really want it to be spent are very limited. So we have a lot of paper partnerships that have not invested and have not co-created. We also have a lot of partnerships where the lead partner has designed the project and then they get other partners to tootle along to deliver it. Well, that's not a partnership, that's a service agreement. You get a contract to deliver what somebody else has. Mm -hmm. So these things, they sound simplistic, but we, we, we collude with allowing that to be the norm. So we all have responsibilities here. Okay, that's so I think those three definitions are quite useful. And because I think the word partnership has been so abused, I now tend to use the word collaboration much more than the word partnership. Because I think it gives you a much open, much more open <coughs> sort of landscape. And then you can bring in consortia and alliances and networks. And really what you're what I'm working with is how to collaborate. How do you get people to cross boundaries, to work against type, to change their behavior. It's, it's, a, it's a collaboration dynamic. It's not how do you partner better dynamic. So I think the word collaboration can be used quite usefully. So I'm going to give some very, very quick observations <coughs> on my current thinking about partnership and then go into partnership brokering. OK, so I mean, this, some of these might sound like real truisms. But I don't, I mean, I still have people coming up saying, actually, Bruce and I were talking first thing, saying, you know, how do we evaluate uh, what, what doesn't, well, most partnerships don't work terribly well. I think that was more or less what we said. And, and then it's because almost always nobody has invested in the partnering process. They've cobbled together a partnership, they rush into the projects, the programs, whatever. The partnership's terribly wobbly. It can't sustain conflict, it can't sustain stress because nobody's actually invested in making the partnership strong enough to withstand whatever's going to come. So process incredibly matters and every single one of us have to keep making that case. Because donors don't invest in process. I'm sorry, I'm being simplistic here. Maybe the Dutch government does. It's a good example, so just funding PEP. But I can't, you know, I can't make these very general statements. But on the whole, donors want projects, and they want the projects to be delivered fast, and they want them to get on with it quickly. And they don't understand that a small investment up front in process will make an enormous, enormous difference in the results from the project. So we have used the partnering cycle that was originally developed um, in the 1990s at IBLS for the partnering initiative. Um, and this is really just to say that you can, in our view, you can map a partnership cycle on top of a project cycle. And they may look very familiar and they should echo each other, but I think they're quite distinctive. And we teach people to really separate out the partnership from the project and to really think about what are the staging posts in the partnership. And of course, it aligns with the project, but not that the minute you get to reaching an agreement, 
that you know you've had your honeymoon and then you go into delivery and you somehow no longer pay any attention to each other. <laughs> Marriage analogies abound in partnership. <laughs> Context matters. Uh, these are real truisms, but this is it is extraordinary to me, particularly in international partnerships, how people talk in incredibly general terms about partnership this and partnership that. A partnership in Pakistan, as we'll hear about from gentlemen from Pakistan, is completely different to Pakistan in uh, to a partnership in London or a partnership in you know the context is almost everything, historically, sociologically, geographically, um, you know, etc., etc., etc. So this is a truism, but it's also very important. And one of our bits of work for PEP, we did a piece of research where we had uh, questionnaires back from 140 partnership brokers who'd been in, who work in very, very different contexts and very different kinds of partnerships. And we asked them which contextual factors were most influential. And it was really interesting. I mean, this is very simple work. It's not great academic, whatever. But you know, this is really interesting. All these factors they see in that sort of order as really impacting their partnerships. So we, can't, we can make some generalizations, I think, about process and protocols. But I think we can make very few generalizations about projects. Each project has its own, its own context, its own dynamic. Principles matter. And as having been one of the people who helped create some foundational principles that are now embedded in the humanitarian principles as defined at Paris and various other places, and I keep seeing them pop up in different publications, so I feel very guilty because I'm now questioning them all. <laughs> but um, it is very important that there are principles underpinning partnership that bind the partners together, that are explicitly explored. We will work this way in order for this partnership to work well. And the three, the three principles that were defined early on were principles that, again, arose from observation, from working in different parts of the world, where you'd bring different players together and you'd ask them what it would take for them to work together, and these would be the principles that they came up with. So they're not my principles, they're the principles that I had fed back to me many times. But the second point here is that a principle becomes a formula very quickly. So it's very easy to say equality, and then every kind of trots it off the tongue and nobody pays any attention to it. It just becomes a language rather than a... So these are the three cartoons. Some of you may have seen them. I'm sorry, they're very small because the slide has another point. The first one is a big person with a little person saying, oh, it's only an idea. Um, the second one is obviously pretending to be terribly nice but underneath being very malignant. And the third one is you know, collaborating against the odds when you're actually competing. Um, you're really competitive rather than... So power imbalance, hidden agendas, and competitiveness which are the kind of very often three things that damage partnerships very easily. So in principle terms, you have to create principles that will help to overcome power imbalance, hidden agendas, and competition. So you hope that will lead to equity. And notice I use the word equity, not equality. I'm very upset that the humanitarian principles translated into equality. It's a very different word. So um, you know, the power imbalance, what you're trying to do is to get that balance fairer. You know, that nobody's going to ever be equal because the world isn't like that, but you can try your best to make for greater parity, greater um, respect for all different people at the table. Hidden agendas, um, you have to create a principle of as much transparency as possible. If, people, if you don't know what people are really thinking or you suspect that somebody is doing something you wouldn't really like, then you really can't say that we're partnering or that we get on with each other easily. And the last one, you have to transform a competitive spirit into a spirit in which you will both benefit, so it's a win-win scenario which is often used. So of course all these are still true, but I do think some of them have become a bit formulaic. And uh, when I was walking from one part of the Rotterdam <laughs> Erasmus University campus to another about six months ago, I had three completely different points of view. So I think these things might be more interesting. In other words, of course there's power imbalance, of course we have to address it, but I think there's a hidden thing, which is why do none of us want to give up control? And partnerships suffer enormously because no player, no individual, and no party is really being willing to give up a bit of control. And we can blame government and say they're the worst, but they're not. Everybody's just the same. NGOs are just as bad. So there's something more subtle than power, which is actually, as people, as entities, we actually quite like to be in charge. So we're asking a big ask when we say to people, you have to give something away. You have to let other people make some of your decisions. And we don't yet have enough evidence, I think, to say if you give something away and you let go of a bit of control, you might get something back, which is much better. And I, that's a great theory, but we don't have enough evidence to prove it's true. The second one, which is um, a little more obscure, is that there's a lot of talk about trust. Um, I always think of trust as being an outcome of a good partnership and never a precondition, because you can't trust people you don't know. You can give them the benefit of the doubt, but you can't. Um, and I think there's something here which is not so much blaming somebody else for not being open 
but questioning ourselves as to whether we are trustworthy. And this interior condition notion is something from Otto Sharma from Theory U, uh, where he talks about um, interviewing a CEO who said the success of any intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. And that's something we use a lot in our teaching. So in other words, not so much what you do, it's who you are. And as partnership practitioners, we all need to be trustworthy. And only if we're trustworthy can we expect other people to also be trustworthy. And there's a lot of stuff talked about, I trusted you, you said, da, da, da. you know, this kind of emotional blackmail that I think is not very helpful. And then the last one is it's not so much competition or collaboration, but it is about a world in which we acknowledge our interdependence. And people don't talk about that very much, but we're fantastically interdependent, it's completely clear. So partnerships should be seen as almost like a microcosm of the truth that we live in an interdependent world. And that idea of interdependence, not independence or dependence, I think is the language that we could employ. So it doesn't mean the other principles are wrong, but it means that we have to keep thinking, and I'm sure you have lots and lots of other ideas to share. In terms of principles, again, this PEP work yielded some very interesting comparisons. So when we asked three of the people who filled, well, the whole people who filled in this form, we took snapshots from three forms, and three different countries had people working in partnerships with three different sets of principles. So we can have global principles, but if you're actually in Nepal, working with eight countries that surround the Himalayas, your first principle is political neutrality. It's got nothing to do with equity, nothing to do with transparency, nothing to do. You know, in other words, you have to create the principles that are appropriate for what you need to be able to function in your context. So they're not, they're not at odds with each other, but they are different. And I think we do need to allow for each partnership to create its own modus operandi and its own principles that are true for them, which of course will yield much more of a sense of uh, co-ownership. Um, I'll just point out the one at the bottom, because uh, Tony talked about being conscious individuals. I, I was thinking when Bruce was talking, perhaps what we need is a much more conscious partnership, po conscious approach to partnering. Because we have partnerships happen, people come and look at them, get frustrated because they're not working very well, report on why not they're working. But somehow that consciousness of making them work better before they start somehow seems to be a bit missing, seems to be a bit of a gap. So becoming more conscious practitioners knowing that when, when, we're, when we're colluding with something, when it's worth challenging something, when it's not the time to challenge, that kind of consciousness, I think, is really quite important. Donors matter. And can be very guilty of making terribly damning statements about donors, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> donors have such power to make or break partnerships. So they can absolutely enable, of course they do, because they give enormous amounts of money to partnership models, but they can also constrain. So we often have situations all over the world where donors will give money to something called a partnership, will have no sense of what it takes to partner, and then will critique it for taking too long because the partnership hasn't, you know, da 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 So somehow investing in the paradigm but not understanding the paradigm or helping to shape the paradigm well enough. And I think they have incredible power and could really turn this around so well by setting standards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is rarely discussed, so I was quite like, bring it out and talking about it, and I really do think that we need to discuss it. I'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, I'll come back to it now, because this is another finding from this PEP project, and I hope you can read a bit. What became very clear in, in these responses we had to our questionnaire was that a very, very high number of partnerships were donor-driven. They were actually driven by funding, so I'm not at all surprised that your NGO statistics says 100% of the reason for partnering with business is to get money. I mean, that, of course, we're all human beings, we all know that's true. But it was very interesting that in my ideological world, partnering was something that could apply to many kinds of interface and collaboration. But actually, most people who talked about partnering were in donor-driven arrangements. They didn't necessarily want to be in, but they got into because they were going to access the funding. And therefore, sort of, and I'm, this, is, this is a me statistic. Oh, it has a PEP logo, sorry. This should have a ROS logo. Um, this is a hunch that I think about 85% of the world's things called partnerships at the moment are donor-driven or funding-driven and therefore essentially compliant in nature. In other words, you have to comply with what the donor asks for. Of course, donors will change and donors will fund very imaginative things. This is not entirely <laughs> negative, but the minute you enter into that relationship, the donor expects a certain degree of compliance. So at the very end of the spectrum, which is n not many people are there, you're really colluding. Along the spectrum, you're compliant or you're compromising. You're not really doing what you might want to do if you had a free reign. At the other end of the spectrum, you're absolutely disruptive. In fact, you don't believe in taking money from anybody because what you want is a world that's an anarchy. So the other end of the spectrum is a disruptive model 
this is different to your continuums, Bruce, because I think the continuum language is quite interesting, is you go into partnership because the current systems are so rubbish that you are going to create partnerships that actually defy the current systems. In other words, you're doing it in order to compensate for the fact that status quo is useless and most institutions don't work. And at one end, it's totally disruptive, so it's anarchy, but along it can be disturbing or it can just be prompted by dissatisfaction. So the question is, what's the middle ground? And I think the middle ground may be in helping us all learn how to challenge and change systems in a way that allows for creative dissent or creative disagreement. I mean, there is some very interesting territory there where we can be different and enjoy it and have different points of view and then create and forge something new that has elements of all the different aspects we're trying to... Anyway, imagination matters. I've covered that already. So in our commitment to due diligence to risk aversion, to anti-corruption. I mean, all these things are incredibly important. I'm not in any way denying that. But there is a real risk that partnerships become so technical and technological that somehow we lose the, the creative spirit or the, the, the real urge to have a phoenix rising from the ashes or whatever it is. So I think imagination really matters. And I think it's really interesting for all of us to think, how do we cultivate imagination? And there are many parts of the world in which the imagination flourishes much more than in the North and the West. So, you know, there may be other places to get that imaginative input, which really gets us to, to think differently. There's another, another sort of little model of, of where do partnerships sit. And if I was plucking numbers out of the air, I, it rather echoes what I've just said, that a very large number are in the reactive realm. Some are in the adaptive realm. It was nice to have you quote Rio Tinto because they funded our first publication. And I have, you know, in their, in, at their best, they've done some really quite interesting stuff. At their worst, they're still rogues and traitors. But um, <laughs> at their best, they have done some very interesting work. And I think they are an example of trying to be adaptive, really trying to reconfigure their modus operandi. But this pathway between adaptive and transformative is quite a big one. So transformative is really opening a door to new thinking, which is what underpins a lot of partnership rhetoric. And I think it's in that realm that we need more partnership brokering. So I'm very quickly going to talk about partnership brokering. Sorry to throw a lot at you. <laughs> Please hold on to anything you disagree with and come and fight me later. Or okay, so this is attempting a definition. So the term partnership broker is not necessarily the best because the word broker in many cultures has very negative connotations. So I'm not particularly advertising this term. What I am trying to present is the idea that you need skilled people who understand partnerships and can help manage the process. So um, we describe somebody in this role, we could call them a process manager if the term partnership broker doesn't appeal. So somebody in this role would help partners to navigate their journey by helping them arrive at the right route. Um, it is the sailboat analogy, which is quite interesting that uh, Bruce used that. In certain cultures, the, work doesn't, the word doesn't work. So these are other alternative words. In French speaking countries, animateur is used quite a lot. Um, boundary spanner has me in hysterics because that's American. And if anybody American? So a, sp a spanner, if I, a spanner means something that spans, like a bridge. In English, English, as opposed to American English, a spanner means a tool with which you tighten up bolts on a car. So it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but if you understood the word spanner as in American use <coughs> of the word, it's a very, it, it is what it is, it's spanning boundaries. <laughs> okay. So the way we see partnership brokering is that they help partners to operate in what we might call complex space. And without going into huge amounts of detail, for those of you who do or don't know about complexity theory, I'm going to spend one second on it because it also matches the train track and the sailboat. So to put it very simply, on the right-hand side, you can look it all up on the web. I looked it up on the web. That's how I know about it. So we don't have to be rocket scientists to get this. On the right-hand right side of the diagram is what you can call um, things that are predictable. And on the left-hand side of the diagram are things that are unpredictable. And this is exactly this, the, the difference between the sailboat, where you don't know when the wind is going to blow and what direction you're going to have to sail, and the train track, where you can decide where you want to get to and how you're going to lay the track across this particular terrain. So what happens is that most people, when they're unconfident or insecure, they push things into the ordered zone, into the predictable zone, because it makes them feel that it's manageable, it's not chaotic. People are quite nervous about chaos and therefore they, they shut the door to complexity. So complexity and chaos get confused. Um, I'm not going to into a great deal, but the point about the unordered space is that you don't know what you don't know. 
So one of the things partnerships at their best are about is discovering when you work together what you don't know, what you don't know about each other, what you don't know about the potential for working together, what you don't know about what would happen if you work together well. So in other words, it's an unknown quantity you're going into with certain things that can be organised and ordered. You know, you ca if you can, you can keep the minutes well, you can communicate in a, in a routine and realistic way. But you do need to hold the space for something to emerge when you don't really know what the potential is. And that's where the imaginative space is, and that's where you'll do something out of the box and unexpected. So actually holding this space is quite important. So one of the roles the partnership brokers may have in helping holding this space. They can be internal. Most people are internal. So in other words, they work for an organisation in a partnership. So 85% of the people who do our course come from Shell, or they come from Oxfam, or they come from whatever. They're within an organisation operating as a partner but they have an additional role on behalf of the organisation to work for the partnership as a whole. And only a very few people, people like me or Helga or others, who are independent partnership brokers who come in as external. And they have very different roles. So the internal broker will be doing the drip feed day by day by day by day. The external broker is much more likely to come in as an expert for a particular piece of work, so to undertake a review or to help um, work through a knotty problem. They work, they're very unlikely to be there accompanying the journey all the way through. They're much more likely to be brought in and out. So two types of broker, but essentially needing the same kinds of skills. Can't read that, so I'll leave that. Um, this is just to show that in this partnering cycle, the partnership broker may have very different roles around the cycle. So I know you can't read this, but it'll be on your slide. So in the first phase, they're much more likely to be scoping, shaping, building relationships. The second phase, they're much more likely to be putting in place good governance <coughs> arrangements, coaching partners themselves to become better at partnering. So there's a huge amount of skills building needs to happen amongst the partners. And the third <coughs> phase, which is what I'm going to focus on, we've had a little break and had some questions, is the broker's role in reviewing and revising partnerships. And the fourth phase is one that nobody ever talks about, is the broker's role in helping partners to move on, whether that means finish, whether it means scale up, whether it means embed, or whether it means doing something new. Moving on phase could be a very creative one. So the partnership brokering isn't just about relationship building. It is also about brokering ideas, brokering innovation, um, challenging, changing, um, building opportunities for, for finding uh, ways of building more capacity, because most partnerships work best when the people in them really have built their own capacity to partner, which means reflecting on their own behavior, um, being being able to step forward to be leading when needed, step back when not, etc. There's certain partnering behaviours that brokers can help to inculcate. And they can also help to create new models because we are looking at new models of partnership being necessary to somehow embrace partnership as a paradigm. So brokering can be much more than just brokering relationship. I think there's, a, there's quite an easy myth, really, that you know, we find that a lot in our training, that people come thinking it's all about being nice to people. It's all people skills. And actually, I think that's, I mean, I happen not to be terribly nice to people and I don't have particularly good people skills, so I don't, th I don't rate those very highly. I think it's much more about brokering ideas and getting people to think differently and holding space. You know, it's, it's more layered, more complex. Brokers can hold a balance between relationship building and the goals of the partnership, between the idea of service, the partnership as a service to humanity or whatever, and leadership as a beacon of change <coughs> and doing things differently, and so on and so forth. So to end this bit about brokering, I think brokering is often involves juggling what I would call contradictions. And I think we do come back to this idea that partnership is complex and often contradictory. It is not simply a kind of program of painting by numbers. So on the one hand, brokers may be supporting and serving the partnership. On the other hand, they might be disruptive. They might be the ones to challenge the status quo, to challenge protocols, to challenge behaviours that are inappropriate, to challenge outdated thinking. Sometimes brokers will work from intuitive insights. Sometimes they will be, well, they expect it to be unaligned or to be neutral. I don't think anybody's neutral, so that seems a bit silly, but to be as fair as possible. And they're expected to build a level playing field. So that's one side of the contradictions, but all the opposites are also true. So a broker may also need to be helped in terms of shaping and directing. Most partners have very little time to give to partnerships. They have day jobs, and they come and do the partnership work fleetingly, on the run, in between all the emails, and they don't give it the time and space it needs. So brokers can really help to kind of cement things and to make sure that uh, it is directional and not being allowed to fall fallow. As well as disrupting, they may need to consolidate, 
as well as working from intuition, they should also work from logical deduction. Rogers have to be superhuman, as you can tell. Um, as well as being unaligned and so-called neutral, they have to be pretty passionate and pretty persistent because partnerships are really hard work. And if they're not persistent, it's quite likely that nobody else will be very persistent. And as well as building a level playing field, everybody matters, everybody has a place. They're also inculcating ways of everybody taking opportunities to lead. I think there's a very interesting interface between collaboration and leadership. And that leadership, which is collaborative in inspiration and is facilitative in its nature, is incredibly important in partnership, and we don't give enough attention to that. So every partner in a partnership should have an opportunity to lead in some way or other, and then you build that kind of balance. That is the briefest introduction to partnership brokering I've ever given, so if it's not complete, <laughs> I'm very sorry. Um, so I now want to look at what is the role of partnership brokers or people who are involved in process management in the monitoring and evaluation space. So this is an extract from a, the, the things you missed, I skipped over, are extracts from logbooks that partnership brokers write as part of their accreditation pathway. So this is little insights into what they're thinking about. So this is one which says at the end, um, the way she worked with this particular review was to enable people to see a wider picture as opposed to the narrow focus of how many, how much, that had characterised all the earlier interventions, all the earlier kinds of reviews and evaluations that had been undertaken. So the broker was really concerned with how to draw out of the partnership the hidden stuff, the more complex stuff, the more layered stuff, the discontents, not just the bravado, the achievements of the project, but the layers of the partnership. And I do want to say, because Joost has just made the point, and I, sh I always take it as an assumption, but I should say it anyway, um, that I, however passionate I am about partnerships, I absolutely do not think partnerships are an end in themselves. The focus on partnering process is in order to make the partnerships more productive and have sustainable outcomes. I'm just focusing on process for the sake of making those partnerships productive, not because I think partner for partnering for partner's sake. And, and the way we teach partnership brokers, we do teach them, we hope, to be pretty good at judging when a partnership is inappropriate. And a good broker will actually stop a partnership or will move it on or will change it or will suggest not partnering. So this is not a promotion for partnering for partnering's sake. It's just saying if you're going to partner, let's try and do it a bit better and let's do it uh, with more impact. So we've evolved a kind of fourfold way of looking at partnerships. This is really material that we use in our training course. Um, and we call it evaluating partnerships, although I think we're pretty uncomfortable about the word, word evaluating. So we haven't yet got a word in the middle that somehow encompasses the range of what we're trying to do, which is uh, another cause for debate. The first um, area would be what we might call the project focus, which is really basically mainstream evaluation, tracking a project, did it do what it said it was going to do, um, and estimating some kind of impact of the partnership's project activity. So that's very straightforward. I'll talk about the broker's role <coughs> in a moment. The second one is what we might call the partnership focus. And there is beginning to be a little bit more focus on was the partnership working and not just did the project deliver. I mean, most partnerships have to um, report against project deliverables. Very few partnerships have to report against how well the partnership works. But many partnerships themselves are interested in asking that question for two reasons. And the first one is whether it is being efficient and many partnerships are incredibly inefficient. So one good reason for doing this is that you can make partnerships much more efficient if you understand what the blocks are, what the communication problems are, what isn't working well, how many meetings you have to have to make a decision about a teacup. I mean, the, the kind of thing about having to meet, having to have consensus about everything, that needs to be solved, it needs to be cracked. That's simply not good use of time. This is about putting rigor into the partnering process. But even more is the second one, is what was the value to the partners of being involved in this partnership? And very few people ask that question. But if we um, take Bruce's point earlier about the motivation for partnering being a huge driver, it's pretty important that the partners actually check out whether the motivation for being in the partnership is being met. If I'm a business and I wanted to get a better reputation, how do I check whether I'm getting a better reputation because I went into this partnership? Because that's the benefit I was expecting from being involved in this thing. Now, you might say, well, each partner can go away and do it themselves. But if they do it themselves, how do they then share it? And wouldn't it help better to build the partnership if they do it together? Because then they learn to understand each other's motivations and each other's values and each other's needs for benefit much better than they might otherwise do. Does that make sense? If you do it somehow as a group on behalf of the group, you're not only finding out about your own value added, your own benefits or not benefits, but you're also <coughs> learning about what other people need and wanted and are getting or not getting, and it helps you to be more concerned about whether they're getting what they need so you can get what you need. It's a much, you know, you can make it part of the iterative process of building the partnership. So that's what we would call a partnership focus. And I've now been involved, I think, in five evaluations of a partnership program 
where there was a conventional um, review of the project and the project impact, and the donor did not ask for a review of the partnership, but the partners, probably under my influence, decided they'd do one. And then they decided to do it for themselves because they were just genuinely interested as to whether it was efficient, whether it'd become more efficient, whether they could get more value than they were getting. And then when they'd done it, they were so pleased with the results, they put in as an appendix to the formal thing that went to the donors. And every single time, the donor reported back saying, thanks for the great report, very pleased the product's going well, but the appendix was really fascinating. <laughs> so I think we can be a bit bold. We can just say we, there are things we want you to know, <laughs> not just you know, we will tell you what you're asking us for, but there are things that we want you to understand. And you know, if we go back to this earlier premise, every party in this whole game needs to understand the paradigm better than any of us understand it at the moment. So any bit of sharing and information and concerns is useful. The third one is where the broker is the focus because we now have a new animal. <laughs> so there is somebody who is now becoming an intervener in the partnership who has a role in the partnership. And it's you know, certainly it's of interest to us to assess um, whether the broker themselves are being effective, whether there are some negative connotations, the broker is doing too much, the partners are getting lazy, the broker uh, stays in role too long because they want to pay their mortgage you know, et cetera, et cetera. There may be some negatives about having a partnership broker, so this ought to be explored. And we ought to somehow be able to compare what positive difference can a broker make, because I'm making a lot of assertions here. And, you know, it would be interesting. And we get a lot of reports back saying it made a big difference once I'd done the course, for instance, as, as many people do find when they do courses that are useful. Um, but we should really look at whether a broker is really necessary to achieve the, the speed, the rigor, the results that I'm suggesting. And the last but not least is the paradigm itself. And maybe this August University is doing a lot of research into the paradigm. I'm not aware of a lot of it. In other words, can we compare what would happen if we didn't do partnerships at all? Because we make an enormous assumption that, it, that partnerships will solve the problem. The SDGs are predicated on partnerships being successful. And is anybody really saying, hmm, let's compare it to when we didn't partner because some things actually work much better? And so there's very little of that. And I don't think any of us in this room really have the answer to that, but it feels like it's part of the fourth part of the picture. So in other words, monitoring and evaluation from where we're standing has four aspects. And the partnership broker's role is different in each. So in the first one, the partnership broker wouldn't necessarily have a particularly big role because it's a project, so you'd have ordinary project processes for assessing value. In the reviewing the partnership, we would argue the partnership broker can be a very important facilitator because they probably know the partners well. They can bring <coughs> them to the table. They can create an atmosphere in which people will speak freely. They can drill down. They, they have a, a level of um, ability to kind of uh, help the partners disgorge or explore what they don't know because the partners often don't know what they don't know. It's like none of us know what we don't know. So you have to get the partners in the room and ask the questions for then things to come out. And I did lots of reviews in the early days of Rio Tinto where getting the partners, the NGOs and the company in the room at the same time, which was often quite controversial, I'll tell you a million stories, I haven't got time, um, but where you'd ask a question that suddenly somebody would say something that nobody else had heard before. And that would lead to a conversation that then deepened their relationship and raised all sorts of questions about new ways of working. So that kind of facilitation role, I think a broker can do well. Um, in, the, in that domain, I think a broker is an advocate. So I think, I hope, partnership brokers to take upon themselves to challenge, to raise questions, to be the resident skeptic, to make people look at the whole paradigm in a slightly more critical way. And of course, in the last one, the broker is a subject. So these are different ways of relating to four different aspects of evaluation. Um, just very quickly, so we, we have evolved certain ways of working on partnership, on assessing or um, establishing the value of a partnership using a kind of partnership brokering approach. Uh, so one cluster of work is uh, where I've called us uh, partnership brokers as storytellers. So I do think some of the most valuable ways of recording partnerships is recording them as kinds of stories. Uh, people really like stories. When people say they want case studies, I think they really want stories. They want, they want to get excited by things. They want to enter into, imaginatively enter into people's experience. So we were very lucky in being asked to track the START network. I mentioned them before. This is a 26 humanitarian agencies, largely in the UK, but not exclusively, um, coming together to, to um, crowdfund and to fund uh, emergency response uh, in a very new way. So this is a sequence, and we're doing one every year. And the first one was really just capturing the history. The history started with four humanitarian sector um, heads of humanitarian departments from four big, big agencies meeting in a pub regularly because they were very frustrated with their own organizations and they liked to meet their peers across organizations. And in the pub, they said, wouldn't it be great if? 
So when we wrote the first case study, that's the opening paragraph for mm, Met in a Pub. And when I was sending it through to the director of Start saying, here's the case study, he said, oh, we can't say they met in a pub. You know, what is Diffie going to say? <laughs> so I said, I said, it's the history. They met in a pub. And ever since then, everybody who's read this case study has said, isn't it amazing what came from that meeting in the pub? <laughs> so in other words, if you can capture the story really as a story, how it happened, and otherwise so much of the real layers of partnership gets lost because we only see the projects, we only see the results. And if it's finished, there is no record of what was achieved, what the mountain was that was climbed, who said who to what, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The second one came from a line, f so I was facilitating one of their board meetings, and somebody said, well, of course, in this room, we all get on with each other very well, but out there in the field, it's all power and politics. So we gave that the title. And then we spent the whole case study looking at what was the power and what was the politics. It was a bit mean on him, <laughs> because he, he said it's a very throwaway line. And then the last one was actually just done with the team, because they're now a team of 15 people. And Tony is one. Um, and we called it the realities behind the rhetoric, because Start has a big rhetoric. It has a statement of intent that says, the humanitarian sector is broken. We're going to heal the humanitarian sector, whatever. Um, and underneath it are people running and having nervous breakdowns, trying to, trying, to, trying to deliver what they're being asked to deliver, which is six people's job for each person, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an entire, it's almost like a voice of conscience of all the staff who have to deliver it. So each story is different, but collectively they make up a story. Anyway, partnership brokers are storytellers. The second one was a um, program we worked in in Myanmar where we were part of the team of four partners and it was working to create training in negotiation skills, conflict resolution and partnership brokering in a particular area in Myanmar. And the two people who were working from PBA were given this additional, this is amazing, this is CEDA, so any rude remarks about donors go out the window is what I'm about to say, because they, we persuaded them, or actually the people we were working with in Canada persuaded them to take on a case study element to this work because it was very groundbreaking, it was very unexpected. So our two people were there as part of the team creating the training and delivering the training, but one of them had the role of being participant observers. They were tracking the partnership. And it was a very layered partnership from CEDA and the strategic planners at the top, decision makers at the top, the bosses of each of the organizations, of which I was one, the people in the field, and then the community. There were four, if not five layers, and they tracked all five layers. And the interface between the layers was completely dreadful. So there was actually no connection between the top and the bottom. And everything that was asked for at the top was completely at odds with what was being emerged at the bottom. So it was a really interesting uh, case study that actually the, the paradigm of partnership was really difficult to make work. And a lot of things that were happening at the field level were not only at odds, but they were actually they, they were put in peril <laughs> by demands that were coming from a linear system. And when we wrote it, we thought they wouldn't publish it, and they did, so great credit to them. So these, these stories, and they are stories, the, the case study stories. Uh, so this is done by brokers kind of who are inside, outside. Um, so we have two others. So one is partnership brokers as informants, and other, this is another project that came out of the PEP program, as I mentioned before. And this is actually seeing partnership brokers as a source of information, because these partnership brokers in all sectors, they come from business, they come from you know, all sectors, they come from all contexts, and they might have individual partisan points of view, but when you put them together, they become very, very interesting knowledge uh, because they are at the coalface of trying to make partnerships work and they have very interesting insights. So that's where you can use partnership brokers as informants. And then we have also done an inquiry into partnership brokering because the inquiry into partnership brokering was an analysis of 250 logbooks that partnership brokers had written as part of their accreditation practice. And the secret to that was that we gave it to three students from university who knew nothing whatever about partnership and even less about brokering. So we just asked them to read all these logbooks and surface what they found interesting, what they thought was significant, or what they thought was happened. And they came up with a document that we then obviously narrated. Um, and that's become what partnership brokers do an inquiry into practice. That's from 250 logbooks. And that's also really <coughs> interesting. Anyway, last slide that I really do want to put up here, which is if we're trying to get people to understand the value of partnership, we better have a long list of what value might be. If we want to get away from just funding or just project impacts, what are the other layers of value that we can expect? So we kind of present this to our partnership brokers as almost like a checklist. And I would say to a broker trying to initiate a partnership or partnership uh, initiating from scratch, um, if you can't point to at least three <coughs> things on one of these <laughs> columns, you shouldn't be in a partnership. In other words, we should be driving partnerships to have layers and layers and layers and layers of value. And if they only have one layer or only one thing, 
that partnership is not necessary. It's too cumbersome an object. It's too cumbersome an animal to really um, be worth it. But as a broker or as somebody who's trying to drive partnerships, you can have in the back of your mind, perhaps we could get this. Perhaps we could actually change the system. Perhaps we could influence the way this company does business. Perhaps we could, you know, there's a million things that actually could be touched on if somebody is giving it that kind of narrative mind. <coughs> There are a range of roles. I showed you that table of the roles changing around the partnering cycle. So a range of roles for brokers in this point of the cycle. So these are the questions. <laughs> so just really curious about anything I've said. What many of you are in monitoring and evaluation specialism. So really interested as to how this complements. Maybe it's very different. Maybe it's uh, wrong thinking. Really happy to get any response or any questions. Thank you very much for the uh, enlightening uh, presentation. My name is uh, Adrian Kurva. Um, when I was working with the uh, USAID projects, there was a research conducted like 10 years ago about the effectiveness of collaborative partnerships in the area of food security and nutrition. And the result of that was that there wasn't actually any added value. It was actually damaging to the impact. Uh, I was wondering what examples you would have of other comparative studies that have been conducted maybe, maybe in the European context that would mm. shed any light on partnerships. Uh, <laughs> question from hell. <laughs> okay, I'm holding the question. Hi, I'm Hi. Karen Kennedy from uh, Trocra, Caritas Ireland. Um, thank you very much. It's been a really um, insightful and inspiring presentation. Um, my organization works exclusively through partnership. We don't directly implement. So in effect, I suppose all our field staff are being asked to be partnership brokers. Um, so I, um, I guess I'm wondering if you have any advice or insights around how do you create a, a conducive culture within an organization when you're having so much partnership brokering going on kind mm. of across an organization. Mm. Hi, I'm Julia McCall from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I was interested in the four types of evaluation you mentioned and if you have any examples of evaluations where it's been possible to, to link the project results to the results of the, um, the, the sort of the success of the, of yes. the partnership itself. Yeah. Um, in the end, that's, that's uh, what we're all hoping to, to yes. find out about. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine from Uganda. I'm here um, on Managing for Impact conference. Um, the whole thing of partnering is not new to my country, but what is new is uh, the brokering. <laughs> it is new it's a new terminology. But um, I'm thinking if you were to introduce it in an organization, um, shouldn't it be done at a more managerial level because it involves uh, changing minds, changing policy, it's rather high level and uh, from what you say its implementation would be better done from the grassroots. So how can it be implemented in institutions like ours? I work for Office of the Prime Minister which is purely political. Thank mm. you. So the two questions are about, do you have examples? I'm going to go away and think about it between now and tomorrow, and I promise to get back to you before the end of tomorrow, because I don't want to do something off the top of my head. I'd prefer to do it properly. Um, the other two are really interesting, because they're both about internal, sort of to some extent internal stuff. And when we ran the Cambridge course, it was a very interesting finding that uh, we'd send people off in the middle of the year to go and do some long-distance partnering case study work. And year after year after year, every group came back saying the internal challenges of partnering were greater than the external challenges. And the first year, I thought, this is rubbish. What are they talking about? It's not a very bad job. Second year, I had to listen. And by the time I got to the fourth year, I'm kind of thinking, OK, <laughs> better rethink my thinking. And, and the reality is that actually there's an enormous amount of problem that comes from internal systems. Well, USOT may be one. I mean, the systems themselves are very much locked into business as usual. And very often, I often draw a picture when I'm teaching of the partnership broker who's facing, the internal partnership broker who has their own system behind them and is facing the partnership and saying, it's fine, we're really into this, we're really going to do a great job, blah, blah, blah. knowing their own system is probably really not even aware of it, or if they're aware of it, quite resistant to it, or if they're not resistant to it, sitting on the fence waiting to see whether it's going to do anything useful, <coughs> and very much not changing their normal habits. So they're having to kind of defend a system that's a bit ossified, to a partnership that's very new and unknown. And then to the par from the partnership, they're going back to their system saying, I know it's taking three years and it should have taken three weeks, but it is getting there, I promise. All these meetings are worthwhile. <laughs> you know, so this person is in the middle of having to defend two different systems that are, that are really both. Anyway, the internal stuff about how do you 
let's start with a management question. Um, it, there, there's often in many systems an enormous gap between managers who have very precise deliverables and have no time to think and have no time to, to question what they're doing because their jobs and their bonuses and whatever it is depend on these deliverables. So they're very, 99.9% .9 of their brain is caught up with business as usual and they have no time. I mean, it's amazing how little time we give ourselves to think. Um, who was this? Telling, was it you telling me that nobody, nobody somebody told me that nobody reads them. Oh, told a story about one of the case studies that one of the board members for Start asked uh, the director to ask me to write an executive summary. So I sent the message back saying why, and they sent the message back saying they didn't have, to read, have time to read the case study. So I said, it's 16 pages, it'll take you 15 minutes. And they said, no, no, we just need headlines. And I said, I can't write you headlines about a process. So if you haven't got time to read it, then that's fine, just don't read it. And it's this extraordinary, it's kind of their, their board of their organization <laughs> of something they have put money into, put and they had, didn't have time to read a 16-page case study. So there's something about nobody having time to really refresh and rethink and recalibrate their brains. So yes, you have to get managers, a very long way of saying, you have to get managers to buy into investing in capacity and system change and system questioning. And if you don't get that, all the groundwork will just become exhausting and people will just end up getting very disillusioned. So there's a, there has to be a connection between changing the way managers are thinking about partnership. That has to be almost like a first step. And then somehow leaving space for the grassroots experience to penetrate into the system. So it isn't just an add-on. It is actually part of the added value is that the partnership itself will impact the system for good. Most <coughs> partnerships don't think like that. If you're trying to get coherence, <laughs> You know, if you have 80 people in a 300 organization all being partnership brokers and 79 of them do it differently from everybody else, then there's a real problem with having coherence. So how do you build, um, it's one of those contradictions, how do you build enough coherence so there's a common language, there's a common approach. If people come to your organization, whoever they get, they know they're going to get something similar in the way of approach. At the same time, giving people the freedom to be individuals, because my thing about the interior condition I think is also very important. We operate in this space as individuals with hearts and minds and experiences and biases and prejudices. And you know, somehow we need to be ourselves, but be open to being changed. And if you can create that culture amongst that group of 80, and it takes working at. I mean, the Partnership Brokers Association, looking at Helga, she's a colleague trainer. Um, you know, we meet once a year for three days, this little training group, just so that we challenge each other <laughs> to make sure we're still on the same page, even though we're very different as personalities. And probably if you did the course with one or other, you get a different experience. So you have to invest in building coherence. So it's, it's two things. Uh, my name is Gabi Spitz. I work at uh, Kaleidos Research, and I'm also uh, working at uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen, where I do research on partnerships. And I recently did a survey uh, on the process of, of partnering. And what I found very interesting there is that uh, people value their own contribution or the contribution of their own organization to the partnership very highly. But when we ask them, is the uh, contribution of the partner <laughs> valuable to you, they were much less positive. And mm. um, so I, what <laughs> we read from that is also that it's hard to say that you need yes. a partner. Yes. And I was wondering, what can you do in the, in the process? Well, to, to make sure that, that people um, are more open to saying that, that they, are more that they can be more vulnerable in, in the mm. collaboration process. Yes, I'm just saying when they did research on uh, the value of partnering, that people valued their own contributions much more than they valued anybody else's contributions. And this was kind of very interesting. It was almost as if somehow there's some, I think you were talking about mindset. And I think this is, I haven't even mentioned that word, but I think this is a huge requirement that there's a lot of mindset shifting that has to happen here. And that we, um, we have a colleague who, who's, it's very interesting, the colleagues you get, because one of our colleagues is a, psychoth a trained psychotherapist. And I think because of her, we've become much more aware, A, of the importance of groups and understanding groups, which I haven't mentioned at all. But really understanding what happens in a group is an incredibly fundamental aspect of partnering because people behave in certain ways in groups. I'm going off a tangent here, but never mind. <laughs> One aspect of being in a group is that only 50% of the world really like working in groups, and that's all the extroverts. And the people who are introverts don't really like working in groups very much because they like doing things their own way in a quiet space. And they come back five minutes later, like I'm coming back tomorrow because I'm an introvert. So I'd like to have time to think it through. 
So we have a dynamic, we have a paradigm called partnership in which really a lot of it happens by people meeting and working things out as a group, and half the group doesn't really thrive in that atmosphere. So I wouldn't never have thought this <laughs> until this. But she also um, is somebody, so why was I mentioning our colleague Vogel, um, who talks about mental models a lot and how much we are fixed on our own mental models. And that a lot about the partnership as a paradigm is an opportunity to challenge each other's and our own mental models. And that really things happen when people are, are engaged with many parts of their being. That it isn't just a way to do day-to-day -day work. It's a way of really asking questions about fundamental values and why they're in this role and what could be different and how they can bring more of themselves to the table. I mean, it's, 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 it is a much more disruptive, with a small d, process offering the opportunity to kind of disrupt complacency because we do all get smug quite quickly. And this is, you know, you know, we know best and we've done it for years and it works fine and ah, go away. You know, it's, it's very easy for us as human beings to rest on our laurels and to stay in the safe space. So again, I would argue that brokers have a duty really to, <laughs> to try and uh, intrude into that a bit. That doesn't really answer your question. What was your question? Answered <laughs> 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 enough. <laughs> okay, but but it is it is about mental models, and um, I suppose that's why I think brokers have a real role in facilitating reviews because some people uh, might say they're not neutral enough because they've had a part to play, and it may be that they're not neutral enough, and somebody else needs to come and help them. But I do think if they've got a a good working relationship with the partnership, they can help the partners to be more honest. They can create enough safe space for the partners to really critique each other or whatever, I mean, sort of come up with. And I think where that works, it's pretty powerful because people, you see people changing. You actually see people changing. And they, they do differently from then onwards. Of course, what happens quite often is that people then leave their jobs because they find they can't work within their systems anymore. So there's a bit of a warning <laughs> attached to that. But, um, you know, this, this dynamic of how do you work within a system and try to crack the system or make it different or expose it or explode it while being within it is a dilemma that almost everybody faces. And it becomes eventually, it becomes almost a moral, a kind of personal courage issue as well as um, logical. Great, uh, thank you. My name is Megan Kulner. I'm at The Hunger Project. And we're going through a transitioning at the organization right now on learning culture and establishing that. And I saw a lot of relationship between leaving the space to learn uh, and collaborate also. So just kind of as a note, but um, I'm an I'm an M&E, and uh, I, when I was looking at your diagram of the role of partnership brokers in M&E processes for partnerships, I was sort of wondering what the inverse of that is. What are the role of say M&E professionals in partnership mm -hmm. broking? You know, and, and creating these relationships, um, and how where do they advise and where do they serve? And I think mm -hmm. there are probably a handful of us at least uh, who are in that position. So I'd love your insights on. Mm -hmm on that role and that need. I'm not an M&E specialist at all, so there's probably lots and lots of rich experience in the room that I just don't know about. But where there is, I can connect you. I, I, I just want, I suppose the one thing I want to say was that I do think a lot of what I've talked about in these examples is more or less qualitative, could be described as qualitative. And I s from where I'm standing, I think there's, um, quite often people think quantitative is synonymous with rigor and qualitative is synonymous with not rigor. And I think what I'm trying to argue for here is you can apply serious rigor to qualitative processes. And that's what I think we're trying to work through is how can you be very disciplined? You know, this is a disciplined thing. We have no time to waste. We have no money to waste. We can't afford the paradigm to just keep being useless. You know, it's in everybody's interest to really push to make this work better. And this requires an immense amount of rigor and self-discipline and disciplined approach. So, so these things I'm articulating, they're not loose. They're actually quite, they're quite tough. And quite often if you're doing the case study storytelling stuff, you have to give a lot of, you have to give a lot of confidence to the people whose stories you're telling. So for instance, the, start, the first start one, I told a little funny joke <coughs> about it, but um, it's quite critical of the director, or at least it's quite critical of how you are the director when you're passionate about change and you're not a terribly good but you're passionate about change, and yet somehow all the people under you are kind of going mad because you don't know how to manage them. But they admire you like mad because they're so brilliant. You know, and that dilemma, and that's in the case study. And, and you know, he had to swallow very hard. <laughs> and I said, you know, people will appreciate it. The first review it got was, 
this director by name, is to be completely congratulated for being so open, so honest, so transparent. And you know, it took you know a day of my time to make him confident enough to not sanitize. You know, so there's a lot of that going on. So that's what I mean by rigor. It's not shirking the difficult issues. The second has a chapter on donors. Interviewed all the people at Diffit who were giving the money. The do it was called do Donor Dilemmas, and it was about it was about just the transparent dilemma of being a donor who needs rigorous reporting, who is absolutely accountable to public funds, all completely understood. At the same time, is putting such conditions onto people's behaviour that the partnership can't flourish. And it's a genuine dilemma. So it's not nobody's wrong. You just have to kind of present it, and then you can have a discussion. So it's that kind of process. Uh, Rob Contel, the partnership <laughs> resource at, at Erasmus University, but also one of the PEP partners. To what extent should a broker, in your view, also know the content, know the problem? Yeah, and absolutely. to what extent should you bring that into the, 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 the role at various phases of the partnering process? I think that is a quite a, a tension. Have you any tips? Okay, the same question is often asked about facilitators. In, if you're facilitating a, a group or a process, do you have to be an, a technical expert in the subject? Um, first of all, um, I think brokering is much more layered and much more complex and, and much more of a job than a facilitator. And I think it probably depends on the relationship of the broker to that partnership um, and what they're being asked to do at any particular time. And my answer, if you're asking me about a facilitator, because we also train brokers to be good facilitators, is that personally I believe that they don't need to know so much about content because actually sometimes it helps not to know because you can really then study process. And you don't get caught up in the nuances. So if, you know, if you're in a water partnership and you have to be an expert on water, it's very easy to get involved in the conversation instead of saying, has this subject been done to death? Do we need to bring in a new dimension? You know, it's sort of somehow you have one layer of neutrality. But of course that's not always true because most internal brokers, 80% are involved in the partnership, so they're quite likely to be content experts. And I think what we talk about then is um, maybe you have three hats. So one hat is a content hat, one hat is your organization's hat, and one hat is your brokering hat. And at any point, this is again discipline, rigor, I am now operating as a broker, and in this role I would suggest we do so-and-so. Or I'm now representing Microsoft, <laughs> and this is my organization, so I'm talking about Microsoft's interests. So it's, it's more a question of being very clear about which role you're taking up on at uh, any particular time and what kind of brokering is being asked to do. So I don't think it's a very easy right or wrong answer. My name is Henk Vilhuis from Oud Certified uh, m and &E Department. Uh, I would like to connect with the previous session because what you just shared with us is a very rich picture from the inside and I really take home this idea that partnerships are more a, an art and a craft than a science. Nevertheless, we started with a scientist and we have here uh, a, a lot of academics. So I'm trying to, to distill from this, okay, if the particular and the context and, and, the, and the human aspect and the, the psychology and the group dynamics is so important and every partnership is particular, what is then the, the th what is theory telling us? How can mm. theory inform our thinking and our practice about partnerships? Are there some laws of partnerships that mm. we could, that could help steer our, our policies and the way we go about it? And maybe that's not for you, but also for the, the, the fellow yeah. academics to, to <laughs> reflect <laughs> upon. Yeah, okay, so I'm completely intrigued that you said that because uh, the partnership brokering work was started by two of us, and my colleague who, who left to go into the private sector some many years ago now. He is an absolute analytical scientist. And I'm a completely mad maverick, I suppose, artist, in inverted commas, I'm not saying artist, but I'm on that side of the coin. And when we first ran the course, we had the, the entire group in hysterics because we were complete diametric opposites. And we were just, and, but I learned more from him than I've ever learned. It was the most difficult partnership I've ever had because he was a nightmare and he thought I was a nightmare. So we had a great time. <laughs> we would never voluntarily go and have a drink together because we found each other so maddening. But actually what was really interesting was that we <coughs> almost changed changed roles. So at the point that he left, and I said, how am I going to manage without you? He said, you can be me. And I was totally taken aback. And I suddenly knew he was right, because I'd learnt, I'd understood his thinking. So actually now I would think of brokering very much more as being a balance between art and science. And we talk about that quite a lot. So I didn't show the slide that says, for all the people skills, you also need um, an immense amount of analytical skills. For all the p passion and persistence, you need a great deal of objectivity and um, and ability to diagnose. 
So I think actually you need both. And if you can't be both as a person, then you need another person to work with. And that actually a good broker will not allow it to go too far in either direction. If it goes too far down the technical or the scientific or the analytical route, you lose the imagination and the intuition. If you go too far down the intuition route, it becomes woolly and soupy and post hippie. <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> so, so you need this, this, the whole thing is a balancing act, and and you know the partners. The, the I also haven't said what brokers should really be doing is to enable the partners to take on these roles. A broker should be temporary, or episodic. And basically what you want is all the partners to grow into a greater ability to take on these roles and to work on behalf of the whole partnership. And that means complementarity. So if you have some partners who are intuitive, hallelujah. If you have some partners who are analytical, hallelujah. Find out how to get them to work together and give the job to the person who's best at that particular job. So if you have a visioning need, you get your visionary person. If you have um, a rigorous analytical need, you get your analytical person. We don't allocate jobs in partnerships well enough according to those typologies. So I, I don't think of it as art. I know you're getting the art version through me, but if you had another colleague, you'd get something different. Thank you very much. Let's give her a big clap.